Hello friends, uh, in my last video I talked about borders in Africa and um, actually somebody suggested we should go back to the borders and there were comments about how awful it was before colonization and I just want to come back to that question and ask myself was Africa actually peaceful before colonization? That's a pretty interesting question. Again, as I said often, this is not a history channel, so I'm going to touch on some topics, but it's up to us to elaborate further on those. Now, the before we dive into the topic, let's see um, set a bit of the stage, right? Many people have a different perspective on this subject, especially on pre-colonial Africa. We don't have recorded a properly recorded history written by Africans by themselves. The majority growing up, for instance, the majority of books I was reading were written by French or Belgians or, or British people about Africa. So some of the things we really don't know exactly what happened. But some imagine that it is a land, it was a land of eternal peace and harmony, you know, um, while others actually think it was a horrible, instant tribal warfare. But what is the reality really? What was going on in Africa before colonization? So let's look into that one and see if we can understand its social and political dynamics uh, to some extent. So, number one, what I would say is there was a diverse, a sort of a diversity, there were diverse civilization in, in, in Africa, if you, you ask. So, it's not a monolith. Most people who have never been to Africa, they think it was one country, one people, one civilization. One language, sometimes I even ask. Like if you get if I speak Africa as if you're African as if there's one African language, so pre-colonial Africa generally was like home to a multitude of civilizations, uh, each with their own unique culture, their own governance, their own social structure, etc., etc. So from the Mali Empire in the north or the Sahel to down to the Great Zimbabwe or Monomo Monomotata, whatever they call themselves, um, all the way to the southern Zulu Kingdom. So the continent was a mosaic of some sort of powerful kingdoms and the city states. That's generally what Africa was before. Now, there were obviously internal conflicts and the warfare. That's, um, that's no, no, no need to repeat that. Like any parts of the world, natural fact, it was a common in Latin America, in Europe, we know a lot of wars, even a pre-colonial. If you read the Bible, it's just wars after wars after wars. I believe in the East, the Chinese um, dynasties were also warring, etc., etc. So it's not common, it's not specific to Africa. So it has experienced its kind of share of conflicts and the wars. Kingdoms and empires were engaged in the battle for resources, of course, for territory, for power. Uh, the Zulu Kingdom, for instance, was like it expanded its military uh, conquest uh, like around Southern Africa under the, the leadership of the, the great Shaka Zulu. So, but that, as I said, that's not specific to Africa. We have got the other conquistadores in the West as well. Then there's, there was a bit of a trade and diplomacy, uh, despite what we might think that there were primitive um, traps, they still had to trade among themselves, you know. So it wasn't just war and the conflict, there were trade, uh, trade routes um, around the continent, fostering sort of economic interdependence and the cultural exchanges. Uh, there was the trans um, Sahara, like trans Saharan trade, for instance, connecting West Africa to North Africa and the Middle East, bringing some of the goods, but also uh, some ideas and technologies and the language. Um, unfortunately, that includes the trade slaves towards the East, the Arab trade, trade, trade Arab trade. Um, um, the Arab slave trade, 
but it also includes some uh, cultural exchanges if you are on the east african coast you find that there are muslim communities who speak arabic you find the Kiswahili language has got a lot of Arabic influence into it. The word like Marhaba is used or Shukran is pretty close to Asia or to the Middle East, to the Arabic language than to Bantu languages. So there was that sort of, there were those exchanges. Then we have a sort of a structure in the governance, uh, like how societies will organize themselves, because that's another interesting question, uh, because that was before these European model the presidential structures that we know, Republicans, the republics, as we call them now. But many African societies had a sort of sophisticated systems of governance, and most of them, it was just uh, based on consensus and in decision making. So. Uh, at some point you wouldn't have a court for instance a small court there would be the elders of the village would gather together and decide on a certain matter and agree uh, on a consensus level uh, i grew up actually in a system where at a local level there were sort of small uh, village courts uh, between courts where uh, the elders of the village would sit together and listen to witnesses and uh, make a decision on a particular matter uh, before it goes to European sort of uh, courts or European model courts. So that existed long before colonization. Uh, we have a big empire that we know of in the West, which is the Ashanti Empire. It was very well organized with the bureaucracy why, for instance, the Igbo, uh, probably Nigeria and the part of um, the countries close, they practiced a sort of form of democracy through assemblies and the councils. Again, if you're from Nigeria, I know the Igbos are very popular over there. Please leave some comment and enrich this discussion. I talked about uh, having some sort of village court. That brings me to the resolution of conflict mechanism. Because that's a very important thing in every society. There's a conflict. Now we know we call the police and then we go to court. How would, would, would they resolve conflict? So traditionally, African society had various mechanisms for resolving conflicts. Again, I, I am not too old, but I, I saw a lot of those mechanisms because I grew up in a very small village where we didn't always have the police around or a free phone to call the police. There was no such in natural fact. But the elders played a very critical role in the mediation of disputes. So for most part, it was a mediation. It wasn't really, this guy's gonna go to jail. It was, okay, this guy did something wrong. They're gonna apologize or pay a little bit of things it wasn't a court as we know it at the moment and there could be some rituals in the customs that could be a ritual of humiliation for example if you lost like, okay for next month you're not gonna sit with other elders in any uh, gatherings which was humiliating for someone who is uh, who cares because everybody cares about their personalities and some other customs depending on, on 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 the country or the region so those were employed to sort of restore harmony it was quite harmonious i would say i didn't see any major crime growing up and there was no police and there was no jail at that time at least at the village level unless you really committed a huge crime where maybe you killed someone obviously in that case the police will come around but if it was some small like a theft or uh, some local conflicts they were resolved at the village level and sometimes settled even the land disputes sometimes would be resolved unless some of or one of the contenders isn't happy and they want to move things to the courts to the uh, classic regular courts so uh, this demonstrates that while conflicts did occur like anywhere in the world for that matter they were also established ways to manage and resolve them they weren't always out of control especially family and and the village or society small uh, community level conflicts those could easily be resolved without um, any problems many problems i'll say now fast forward 20th century we had the colonization and we had some external influences so it was harder to have 
a mix so in many countries they've got a mixed model of a local or village level of court and the normal courts that are modeled against the European model against a scripted law or a constitution in some countries. So before European colonization, Africa has already been influenced by external forces. So the Europeans weren't the first to arrive in Africa, believe it or not. The Arabs were probably the first ones. They came as a trade traders and explorers. They had a lot of interactions, as I said, and they kind of influenced some parts of Africa, especially on the coast, like uh, Tanzania or Zanzibar in Tanzania, uh, the coast of Pemba, uh, the coast of um, uh, Kenya, which is uh, on the coast, um, uh, Zanzibar, Zanzibar is Tanzania, but uh, there's also part of Kenya that's on the coast and have those influence of the Arabs. So, there is a myth of, of a dark continent, you know, when we talk of Africa, they talk dark continent. And I'm not sure if it, it, it refers to the, the misery of African people over the years or if it refers to the fact that we don't have too much electricity. But that's, that's a joke I'm sitting in there. So, but the notion that Africa was a dark and a savage continent before European intervention is a myth rooted in the colonial propaganda. It wasn't that dark and it wasn't that, uh, there were cultural festivals people were having fun now and then it wasn't always a misery to be honest with you so it was used actually with the uh, the, the colonization to sort of grab land and and colonize our peoples like they did in in, in australia in new zealand in canada in the united states where they think this is a savage people gonna see if it has them they don't know what they're doing so we had our own culture, we have our own things. Um, they were they perfect? Of course not. I mean, the Roman Empire wasn't perfect. The French had a revolution a few centuries prior to colonization. The Russian had their revolutions just at the moment where Europe was dividing Africa uh, and so forth and so on. So nothing was perfect, not in Africa, not in the other parts of the world. So now we've got a complex reality. So pre-colonial was neither a utopia that had to face it. There were wars, there were famine sometimes. There were, I mean, I, as I said, I, my father was an old folk and he knew a lot before colonizations or when before colonization had an influence to a village level and they could tell us of the atrocities they suffered uh, from mother nature to neighbors to the king and all these things so it wasn't necessarily a utopia uh, but at the same time it wasn't a, a land of unending conflict they, they had their time of fun they have their festival when the baby is born they will rejoice when the book be them there's a wedding they will celebrate uh, and they had their fun, they had their time, and they had their songs, their old songs, they got their own old musical instruments that are typically African and they haven't seen in anywhere else. So it was a kind of complex and a dynamic continent with some period of peace and nothing and some period of prosperity as well as some times of war and upheaval. So there was a, just a complex, uh, they were complex as uh, the Israelis were or or any other tribes for that matter. So what do we learn from this? Um, understand the true history of pre-colonial Africa can help us actually appreciate the continent's rich heritage, but also uh, the resilience of its people. They are pretty resilient because I said uh, being uh, left with the mother nature without all these modern amenities and the surviving isn't for, you know, weasels. It also challenges some simplistic narratives and encourages sort of a nuanced view of the Africa's past. And this, what I'm talking about, simplistic saying it was a hellhole and you stop there, or it was a utopian, it was nice and very parad paradise and you stop there. You need to kind of have this balanced view and a nuanced view of what the African past is, probably, as I said, is for um, many other parts of the world. So that's it, guys. Um, not sure if I did the conclusion, but as I said, it's, it's multifaceted. The continent experienced both peace and the conflict pretty much like other part of the world. And by knowing this complexity, we honor actually the rich and the diversity history of um, Africa. 
okay guys um if you enjoyed the video please like subscribe share with your friends and share your thoughts in the comment section right below so yeah what other aspects of african history would you like me to explore please let us know okay thank you for watching guys and see you in the next video harambe <laughs>